after a record cold snap before mouth back to warm weather. During that cold snap, we switched over to corn because of the location of the fields in comparison to where the location of the bean fields were. And we harvested corn for a few days as well as taking a morning off to complete a section of the terrace and tile project that I'm working on. That's our priorities right now is harvest and that project. And by mid-November, both will have been completed. It warmed up. We're back into the 70s. Beautiful weather. We got about 125 acres of soybeans to finish up. That we should be done by Saturday. No problem. Then we'll be back on corn. These beans were also in the drought. Uh, this farm is a ways from our main farm. But also didn't get any rain. Uh, these beans are currently making about 50, uh, 50 to 55 bushel per acre. But I do expect the average to be probably in the high 40s just because there's always a few spots, including a few mud holes, like this one we're going to come up on where you can see the grass and that slough where it was just muddy and the planter was going to sink in, so it just lifted up, plowed our way through the mud last spring, and uh, that kind of kills you. But great weather to finish up the soybean harvest. Be back on corn. Corn yields have been uh, a little less than satisfactory, but we had literally no rain on our main farm. We just had no rain. Uh, we are about 12 to 11 and a half to 12 and a half inches below uh, average, depending on where you're standing on the farm because the rains that got were spotty. There were other people in the area that got more rain. There you might have just saw those planter ruts. Uh, this farm will need a little bit more seep tile for future. So if you're lucky and you got spotty rains, or if you're above Interstate 80 this year in, in Iowa, uh, and you've got a lot of rains, then you should be in pretty good shape. But uh, here in the Southern District, especially the weather in the Western area, we are very dry. And now we're back on corn. Besides seeing how things are in our area, or what's going on on our operation, the context of this video I would like to talk about is how people perceive farmers. Based on Ann Coulter's latest Twitter feed, we now know how she perceives farmers. Depending on what video you watch, what movie you watch, in my opinion, farmers are usually perceived as one of two things. They're either very greedy, large corporate types, or backwoods, hillbilly, ignorant, the clampant type. Most farms in America are family owned. And while they may structure as a corporation, usually that's just for tax purposes, yet they remain to be family owned. The livestock industry could be viewed differently. There are many top rated ag channels that try to highlight what's going on in agriculture as well as connect or cross the bridge between the general public's perception to what is actually occurring on the farm. And they try to do it in creative, fun filled ways through a lot of video editing and pit fiber sales. Whenever I post something that could be perceived as political, I usually find a group of extremists on one side or the other. Additionally, people without content often leave some quite negative remarks on the channel. As I started this video talking about it's been a very dry year, at the same time we've had very wet years. Farmers face all sorts of adversities that most common people would never be subjected to. There are many hypocritical myths throughout farming, as well as a lot of misinformation. One complaint I generally see is about farm crop insurance. You farm for the insurance. Those kind of comments. No one farms for the insurance. It's there as a band-aid in the event of a catastrophic year. For farm crop insurance, half the indemnity or claim is picked up by the federal government. This is also where the hypocrisy starts, as regular household insurance is also backed by the federal government. See, all insurance are reinsured, which is reinsured companies are backed by the government. So in the event of a hurricane wiping out a small insurance company, they go to the reinsurance company, which then again is backed by taxpayers. During COVID, most owners of businesses, farmers included, were eligible for the PPP program. 
at the same time, Joe Biden is now trying to issue a student debt relief program. I don't know many farmers that were willing to turn down the 20000 for PPP, but at the same time, immediately take their social media sources to complain about the student debt relief. Whether you believe in some programs or not others, whether you took some programs or not others, and from my experiences with social media, it seems that people only don't complain when the program pertains to them or what they're going to get out of it. Additionally, farmers are their own worst enemy, as many of the complainers on social media about how to farm is from other farmers. And while, yes, I understand it is a highly competitive business, we are, in an aspirational sense, in the same boat together. Continuing on this venture of essentially calling people out, a lot can be said about fuel prices, and that's an entirely new video on its own. However, while farmers gripe about the price of the pump, they often overlook the ethanol margins that the ethanol producers are getting right now, which allows them to pay a positive basis, and it's one of the reasons that farmers are getting more money. Although, more money doesn't always mean more income, and again, that's another video on its own. Now to talk about the biggest hypocrisy of them all, which would be farm subsidies. On my channel, I've had numerous comments negative about farmers being subsidized, welfare queens, we have two mailboxes, etc. It's not real often that we get direct payments, but when we do as a farmer get a direct payment, it's usually because the market has completely collapsed. And in my opinion, that's usually not about protecting the producer, it's about protecting the bank so that the producer can cover his bills. That's also why we have things like CRP payments and other subsidized things in the ag industry. As many of my viewers have commented on, is that tax breaks are subsidies. The tax code in this country was written with the idea of stimulating the economy or certain sectors of it. The problem with that is it becomes corrupted as campaign promises and our favoritisms. And here you can check out that awesome side digital scale readout. But back to the subject at hand, tax code is not really a subsidy. And if you want to view it as a hypocrisy, people get tax breaks, child tax credits, deduction of one as a dependent deduction of two, husband and wife, or kids. So I guess in retaliation it would be safe to say that people are also personally subsidized. And the farmer in me wants to retaliate and say that your public school systems are largely paid for by property tax, which is largely paid for by landowners, i.e. farmers, at least in this area. If you don't pay your property tax, the government will have a share of sale and take your land from you. So is that a fair evaluation to say that you'll be stricken your land under force of penalty to pay property tax to take care of somebody else's education? The ability to become retaliatory becomes easier and easier as you evaluate each point and topic. They are working on a new farm bill right now, and one of the things that's quote-unquote subsidy, and the biggest part of the pie there would be basically like your EBT or your benefits, not actually what goes to the farmer's portion or how to protect farmers, which basically the USDA at this point is in charge of people's lunches. Developed by Abraham Lincoln, the USDA is the largest government entity or the biggest part of Washington right now, but at the same time does very little for the actual farmers in this country. You can do your own research on the USDA, but if you're like me, the research that you'll find to, was basically a nutshell to ensure cheap food policy. So when farmers complain that the USDA is falsifying reports, there's a good chance they probably are in the idea to keep cheap food. But that's a topic for a different video as it starts to head down a rabbit hole based on my opinion. And I would like to keep this video factual. There are many Americans that make very poor wages, and all of that statistics and data is easily obtainable at your fingertips via Google. 
While many farmers themselves take to social media to complain about such welfare programs as EBT, which is food stamps, I don't feel that many have actually done a lot of research or data points. Putting this into logical terms, livestock eat most of the corn produced in the United States. Most of these soybeans are turned to meal, also for livestock. Now, if you're making $37,000 a year and you got a child, you can barely support uh, living in the cost of a house or an apartment or whatever you're living in, a vehicle, and you go to a job nonstop. Uh, you don't have a lot of money to spend on groceries, especially when you know you can pretty easily eat $800 a month. So, unfortunately, because of all these things and should be a side video of its own here. Many have had their resort to such things as EBT cards to make sure that they can feed their family. So if somebody on EBT goes in, they start buying meat that they couldn't otherwise afford, that's using up cattle. That means that a cattle producer has a place to sell his product, which creates a demand, and the demand for meat also creates a demand for such things as corn. So while most of these farmers are complaining about the food program, I don't feel there would be very good markets for any commodities, including livestock, if there weren't such things as the food program. And there's a much deeper rabbit hole that we could go into on this subject or talk about money as to why this has taken place. There has been a recent movement for $15 an hour minimum wage, and that movement continues to date. As a farmer, we get the commodities prices that are set for us. We don't get to pick and choose them beyond what we can sell our product for, and I covered this topic in my last video. But as a corporation, if they are now forced to pay $15 an hour, they're going to either cut staff, or they will just pass on the extra costs of the higher wages to the consumer. And as those consumers, which are also the wage earners, get more money, they have more spending power, but now have to pay higher prices, which is basically the definition of inflation balance of the economy is actually quite fragile, and as you get both political parties moving back and forth, history usually reflects that when the pendulum swings towards center, that's usually your best times. But again, having done social media, it becomes pretty evident that most people have not even thought through the things that I've laid out so far in this video. The meat market is undoubtedly corrupt in this country, as it's now down to basically four large food companies. In the Department of Justice, allowed all mergers to take place without batting an eye. So while the farmer may get about $1.50 a pound, in the grocery store, at least locally, we've seen it as high as $8 a pound. And packers are reporting record earnings. But when you don't have anywhere else to sell your product, you take what you can get. Some packers are reporting over $1,000 per head profit. And yes, you can Google that one which is substantially more than the farmers make. Additionally, a large amount of our beef is exported to South America or other places around the world while we import, like South America, beef from JBS. And this is why your good tasting meat is gone and the grass-fed crap is in the grocery stores. Now there's been a big country of origin labeling debate occurring over the past few years which is part of the World Trade Organization, and a Canadian producer feels that he'll be at a disadvantage selling his meat here in a U.S. grocery store, which is where a lot of the consumers are at. If it says Made in America, he knows that he'll lose sales, which is an American response to that, especially an American producer, would be tough shit, I don't care. The meat prices and more about this subject, again, should be a video of its own context of this video I'm trying to highlight as to why groceries are the prices that they are and why many Americans have to rely on government or welfare programs. Getting back on point where this video initially was directed there are many many other companies around America that are subsidized either directly or through tax code if you want to call it that. So again it's very hypocritic to single out farmers as being the sole problem or the largest welfare queens out there. As to what farmers make as a personal take on income, widely 
is widely variable, although Coral Cornstar actually did a great video on it uh, explaining how much the farmers make, highlighting and showing that their personal take-home incomes are very little. There should be more about all of these subjects on separate videos, but I strongly feel that many people need to thoroughly research subjects in much more detail, including side subjects or offshoot subjects, before they open their mouth. And if you think your groceries are too high right now, try becoming an importer of food and see what the prices do in the grocery store. One good thing about this country, nobody starves to death. That's something that many people take for granted. And while we all want our kids going to school having a really good meal for the day, or even to fill our own bellies after work, it's all a testament to how the American farmer can produce so much product, balance trade, and do it so efficiently, meanwhile facing all sorts of problems that most of you would never deal with. And while it's highly unlikely that farmers will ever band together to form a collective efforts to support each other, at the same time I think that many of them should open their mind a little more as to what's really occurring or what's going on or how their markets work. And they need to end a lot of the hypocrisy and misinformation. And as social media grows amongst the farm community, I hope that some of you others that are non-farmers uh, learn from this information or content. And I encourage you to go out there on the internet and research things for yourself. Literally, the world is at your fingertips and there's so much you can learn by just taking time and studying. If you don't know a subject, find an expert or find somebody that does know and ask them. If you like this video, hit the subscribe button. If you don't, Please feel free to leave in the comments below or make your own video in a rebuttal or in addition to. And I did try to keep the video non-political, although certain times politicians have heavy influence on the outcome of the topics that we talked about here. Anyway, if you found the video at all interesting, appreciate you watching. We'll see you in the next one. We'll actually return to some farming information.